The future of work to me is going to be more human because if you want to know what we will be mm -hmm. doing, you mm -hmm. have to look at what AI can't do. Mm -hmm. And for example, McKinsey and a number of other studies, they look at workplace capacities and they rank what is automatable. And if you rank it up and you, you squint your eyes, it looks like actually all the human stuff they can't do. You know, they can't deal with unknown situations. They can't provide empathy or apply ethics or be creative or manage many people or motivate many people or educate mm -hmm. people. Those are the things that AI can't do. Mm -hmm. So therefore, whatever the new jobs are, and they will appear, we don't know the names of it, just like we didn't in the past two transformations, but what we will be doing is the most human of our task. So if your job requires face-to-face -face human interactions, so that's why I say the future of work is very good. I'm here today with Richard Baldwin, Professor of International Economics at the Graduate Institute in Geneva. We're here to talk about his new book, The Globotics Upheaval. Thank you for being with us. My pleasure to be here. I often think choosing the questions is 90% of the way there. Get the right question. I think you're right on top of the right question. Thank you, thank you very much. Over the, uh, the years where I've done a little policy relevance, occasionally people have liked my questions, but nobody's ever liked my answers. <laughs> but uh, that's, you know, at least it's well, halfway there. Let's talk about the different transformations. You, you basically have th one prospective and two historic and that have been quite powerful disruptors or challenges to the coherence of society. Sure. So the, the first one, uh, following the Carl Polanyi's book, The Great Transformation, um, is when we went uh, for people working on farms to factories. Uh, they went from living in the countryside to the city side. And the locus of value creation shifted from land to capital. And in the meantime, there was an enormous social upheaval. And it uh, eventually, when it, when at about halfway through, it transitioned from various forms of autocracy uh, as ruling to various forms of democracy. And that, well, that's why they call it the Great Transformation. That essentially disrupted the way people had lived since forever, millennia on millennia, mm -hmm. basically tied to the land. The, the elite um, owned the land and took a share of, of the land, and that was how it worked forever. And then it transitioned into this modern economy where there was growth every, every year, and that was the Great, Great Transformation. It was not easy. Uh, we went through two world wars, the Great Depression, fascism, communism, you know, hundreds of millions of humans died at the hands of other human beings in a large extent because we didn't know how to make industrialization work and it did all sorts of things. But at the end of it, we did uh, learn how to make industrialization work for the, the masses. So that was the first one. Now the second one, <clears throat> which I would date from 1973, and I date that because that's the year the computer on a chip was invented. Mm -hmm. So before, uh, you and I remember what computers looked like before that. Mm -hmm. They were big racks of things. It, it, yeah. I remember my first PCs. You could actually go and pull out a rack, stick in a little more memory, and stick it back in, and it yep. worked. That, yep. And that was how come. Now, that was very difficult for automating in factories uh, because it was you know, bulky and difficult. But once you got the, 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 the central processing unit, the input and output stuff and a little bit of memory all in one little chip, you could put that chip on a robot arm and program it to do mm -hmm. lots of stuff and reprogram mm -hmm. it whenever you want. Now that uh, computerization, as we called it in the first part in the 60s and 70s, that created better substitutes for people who work with their hands these robots in particular. It became like the assembly line operators, operators. unto themselves, the Exa robots. Yeah. Exactly. So, you know, like you had a drill bit and you no longer needed a human hand and eye to operate this thing. You could have a, 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 a robot with a chip on it and, and program it to, to do the exact same thing. But the same technology gave better tools to people who work with their heads. So spreadsheets and uh, mm -hmm. all, all, all sorts mm -hmm. of I, uh, computerization made people like you and me way more productive than we were before. So in some sense it gave people who were smart more brain and more brain power. Mm -hmm. Where the people work with their hands it made better substitutes for them. As robot hands could do what only human hands could do before. And so that twisted this what was sometimes called a skill twist or in, our, in the less poetic terms used in economics now, it's called skill biased technological progress. Mm -hmm. It's such a mouthful to say, but mm -hmm. let's call it a skill twist. You know, if you work with your hands, you were, you, there were lots of substitutes. If you work with your heads, there was lots more tools. And that led us uh, from about 1970 on 
an increase in inequality because, of course, the head workers were the higher paid and their productivity and pay started rising. The ones who worked with their hands, especially in, in manufacturing, it got yes. downsized. And the people who had the most <coughs> menial mechanic jobs, uh, they weren't replaced by robots. So it was like a hollowing out of the middle during this time. And during that, that's what I like to call it the service transition, but many people have other names. Some people call it the post-industrial society or whatever. Mm -hmm. But we went from factories to offices, and the nexus or the locus of value creation moved from capital to knowledge. And you can see, you know, it's, 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 I think that's been going on until about 2016. And all you have to do is look at the most valuable companies in the world. In, if you go back in 1970, they all made things or, you know, drilled yes. things or whatever. And now there's, I think there's only one, uh, um, uh, I think it's BP or mining company, that's in the top five. All the other ones are based on knowledge. The economic transformation was from factories to offices. And the upheaval was what we've just been talking about, that people who had good jobs, you know, with a high school education, you could have a car in the garage and a pension in the bank. That sort of just disappeared, and that upheaval, uh, also the space-based upheaval, that certain places in America did very poorly and other places did very well, mm -hmm. that sort of upheaval um, has led to a few backlashes, uh, probably most famously the election of Trump, yes. Brexit, uh, we had, and in between we had the Occupy Wall Street movement. The Tea Party on the, the right. The Tea Occupy Party on the, the right. Yeah. And we had the battle for Seattle against uh, globalization and starting mm -hmm. from 1989. So there was a series of backlashes, but nothing super coordinated. And I think it's important to say there has been no resolution. Mm -hmm. And that's what's different from the last one. We are left yeah. with a sea of vulnerability, anger, f economic fragility. People are afraid. Uh, and, and so we end this second transition from factories to offices with a sea of discontent like we had, say, in the early yeah. 1900s. We didn't get that period from 1940 to 73 to, how do I say, have resolved and, and enjoy the fruits Abs of that transition. In the, in the Great Transformation, automation lasted a century and then globalization took off. In the second one, it, automation, the robotic stuff, advanced from, say, 1970 to about 1990 when most of it was automation replacing certain jobs. From 1990, the ICT revolution enabled a change in the global organization of production. In particular, ICT allowed it, uh, G7 firms, uh, you know, rich country firms, to put some of their stages of production in nearby developing countries and still coordinate the whole thing. So before ICT, just imagine Bombardier who makes jets, business jets, now they make some of the tails in central Mexico, they make the rest of it in Quebec and they assemble them together. Like before ICT, they would have had to coordinate that with airmail letters or fax. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. just, just imagine hoping that the tails from central Mexico would show up in Quebec and fit if the best you were doing was email. But with ICT, it became quite easy to organize. So to me, that was the gate. They opened the gate to allow complex coordination across borders and so instead of just goods crossing borders, we had factories crossing borders. But that wasn't the key thing that, that led to in increasing disruption. The key was that the G7 firms took their know-how and moved it to the developing countries. Mm -hmm. And what that created for the first time was a combination in manufacturing where we had high tech and low wages. Mm -hmm. So before this uh, global value chain revolution or whatever you want to call it, you either had to produce something in, say, Germany with high-tech, high wages, or in India with low-tech, low wages. Right. And in that world, high-tech, high wage always won. And two, more than two-thirds of all manufacturing was done in the G7 mm -hmm. it, at, at the beginning of, uh, let's say, the end of 1980s. So this completely exaggerated the movement of competition. In essence, it, it wasn't uh, China opening up and learning, you know, exploiting their existing comparative advantage. American, Japanese, and German firms, Taiwanese firms, Korean firms, brought technology to China in manufacturing, which allowed them to make things that they could never have made by themselves, at least at the beginning. And that reinforced the competition that was faced by G7 workers. Yep. So from 1990, they were facing competition from robots at home and China abroad. And that was a very, uh, it essentially exaggerated the economic 
uh, transformation and the upheaval that came with it. So we come to 2016 and we have this really bed of discontent and you know the people like uh, Trump and Brexit that's like treating brain cancer with aspirin. It's, it's made a lot of people feel better but has not addressed any of the underlying questions. Uh, so now in the third phase which I'm what I would like to call the globotics transformation digital technology is the new spark Mm -hmm. And it is operating differently than ICT and mo very differently with, from uh, steam and, and, and mechanical power. Uh, but one thing I think is kind of important is that it's launched globalization and automation at the same time. And it's affecting mostly service sector jobs. Mm -hmm. I think there, so the, the analogy, in, and actually I, when I, I was confused in my mind until I wrote those first two chapters and then everything came in focus. I know how to think about the future, or at least I know a way of thinking about the future. Mm -hmm. But uh, I realized that it was quite different and uh, many people were using lessons of the past to project into the future. And one of the most important things I like to stress in my book is that it's not about manufacturing this time. And for three centuries, both automation and globalization was mostly about making goods or mining goods or growing mm -hmm. goods, but mm -hmm. it was all about physical things. And the digital technology now is really about information and services, a very large amount of our services is really information. Mm -hmm. Gathering, collecting, processing, transmitting, and that's what digital technology is, is, is changing in an explosive way. But both the automation by allowing sort of uh, computers to do things that only humans used to be able to do, I like to call them white collar robots because mm -hmm. <laughs> one of the one of the misthinkings that I came across a lot when I was reading the book is that and and and, and the reviews of my book they frequently the, the newspaper column will have a picture of a physical robot there people are just drawn into this idea of a physical robot but the most disruptive ones are just pieces of software mm -hmm. one for that that's very important but not very well known is called robotic process automation and this is replacing people in, in companies who are doing relatively rule-based manipulation of information is being replaced by this robotic process automation at, at, a, at a pretty furious pace. And what it, if you look at a picture of it, it, it looks like a, a macro. Uh, that's all it is. And it's, uh, mm. it, it take, like, to give you an example, if I send an email to Swisscom to tell them to change my subscription for the 10 days I'm going to be in the United States, there's a person who opens up that email, reads the email, decides what I want, then they open up the subscription database, change my database, they close that, then they open up the billing database, change my billing, close that. And up until very recently, you absolutely needed a human to do that because computers couldn't read emails. But now mm -hmm. they can. Mm -hmm. And robotic process automation, what they're doing is they train this essentially a macro to open the email, read the email, then open up the database, do it the right thing, close that database, open up the billing base and do that, and it does a hundred times faster, more reliably and traceable than the human. And so that's mm -hmm. a unsexy, it doesn't look like a robot, but it is actually a robot, in, in, and that's what the mm -hmm. companies like Blue Prism are calling it, the robotic mm -hmm. or digital workforce and things like that. That's very, very uh, displacing workers in the service sector very quickly. The people who are experiencing, who will, who are experiencing it right now, and will experience it going forward very quickly, they're not used to it. That's right. People in the service sector have never seen automation. Well, really. What What happened to the people in manufacturing for the robots was humanly cruel or unjust in some respects right. too, but they didn't ever get uh, what you might call indoctrinated into a notion that they were deserving because of their education. Right. And this is this is a very dangerous social dynamic. I, I, I agree. That's what the second word in my title is upheaval. And that's what I'm worried about, mm -hmm. that these people who have never experienced globalization or automation are experiencing it for the first time. And they will think it's incredibly unfair. I'm, I'm glad you brought up the unfairness thing. Mm -hmm. As I like to say, unfairness is what puts the rage in outrage. Mm -hmm. And these people will mm -hmm. be, so for instance, look at these white collar robots. They don't ask for holidays. They don't ask for family leave. Mm -hmm. They don't ask for sick days. They certainly don't ask for pay rises. They'll never join a union. That competition with that, you know, this is not like capital adding on to labor and making the labor more productive. These things are designed 
to be a substitute directly right. for a certain right. type of labor. I, I, I you know, we'll spin it out a little bit more in, 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 as we go, but I mean, it's also false to think of these things as junior humans. They're, mm -hmm. they're more like tractors, mm -hmm. which can do some things for the farmer, but can't replace the farmer. But still, if you get enough tractors, you need fewer farmers. And that's that sort of displacement of what's going to go on. Yeah, and, and my understanding is in the structure of the American economy now, almost 70% of the workforce is in services. Yeah. I remember Alan Blinder years ago uh, for the Council on Foreign Relations and others wrote what, what you might call scenarios projecting that, what do you call them, tel telemigrants, telemigrants and others right. were going to change the structure of work and put a lot of pressure. I think he was uh, prescient, but very early. Absolutely, and, absolutely. And, but, but this scenario now seems to be before us in this, uh, what I'll call AI machine learning phase, this third transition. Yeah, so in, in, and actually the estimates he did in 2007, and then they were updated a couple years later with Alan, with um, uh, Alan Kruger at, right. together with them. Those are still the only re serious estimates as to where this is actually gonna affect. So he went to see which jobs are offshoreable. Mm -hmm. And he didn't distinguish too much between manufacturing and services, but he went through everything so you can see what he did in services. Mm -hmm. And he was just basically trying to say, do you actually have to be in the same room with a man, a woman, or a machine? And if you don't, then it was offshoreable. So this transformation is moving from service jobs to sheltered service jobs, jobs mm -hmm. which can't be automated and can't be offshored uh, through telemigration. Though that's where the jobs will move into. That's the transformation. The upheaval is lots of people who thought they had steady jobs or at least steady careers will find that they're now in direct competition with robots or globalization, or I would like to call them globots. Yes. Globalization and robots together. It's, it's, it's causing them at the same time. I think they're going to be very unhappy about it. So uh, this is not like a self-help book, uh, and it's only at the very end that I talk about rules for individuals to adjust to it. Mm -hmm. And it's just what I would like you to take as common horse sense. This is not a brilliant insight or anything like that. So first of all, there's nothing new about this transition. People are going to have to change jobs, right. and they're going to have to retrain to get those new jobs. So it's nothing wrong with the direction of travel. There's nothing new about what's going on in the economy. It just might be going on a little faster, and what skills they need to get may, may be different. And, and politically, it may be more pervasively disruptive. Right, right. Could, we, we could have this upheaval, but I'll get yeah. that with the, with, I, I'm right, going to put right. that to the government's guys. So um, I think in the long run, AI will do what it can, and telemigrants, in other words, people sitting abroad and working in your offices here, they will do what they can, and we will do what they can't. Mm -hmm. So quite simply, the future of work, you have to answer that question first. What will the future of work be before you can say how should we react as individuals to it? So the future of work to me is going to be more human because if you want to know what we will mm -hmm. be doing, you mm -hmm. have to look at what AI can't do. Mm -hmm. And for example, McKinsey and a number of other studies, they look at workplace capacities and they rank what is automatable. And if you rank it up and you, you squint your eyes, it looks like actually all the human stuff they can't do. You know, they can't deal with unknown situations. They can't provide empathy or apply ethics or be creative or manage many people or motivate many people or educate mm -hmm. people. Those are the things that AI can't do. Mm -hmm. So therefore, whatever the new jobs are, and they will appear, we don't know the names of it, just like we did in the past two transformations, but what we will be doing is the most human of our task. And the second thing is because telemigrants are so much cheaper, uh, we will have to do what they can't. And the only thing they can't do is be in the same room. Mm -hmm. So whatever's left over is, will involve you being in the same room with a machine or some test tubes or laboratories or mostly other people. So if your job requires face-to-face -face human interactions. So that's why I say the future of work is very good. The jobs will be more human mm -hmm. and more local, and hopefully we'll be, we will be more productive, therefore we'll be richer, so hopefully we'll be more generous. And, and nice rewards future. will be given to the emotionally intelligent. Right, so, so <laughs> as I, like if, if, you, if you do the transition, it's like what STEAM did is gave more power to people work with their hands, didn't change much for people work with their heads. The second one provided substitutes for people who work with their hands, more tools for people who work with their heads. In an equally bold way, 
this is giving more tools to people who have heart. Yeah. That AI is augmenting the intelligence and giving pattern experience-based pattern recognition mm -hmm. to people of average intelligence, but they need good heart. Mm -hmm. uh, and since the distribution of heart is not really lined up with income distribution, it's not clear at all to me that this is going to be bad. Let's go to the politics Okay, now. the politics, the politics of, now. You, I mean, I'm listening to you and you're saying from the hand to the head to the heart, like don't that. give up on humanity. Yeah. And we may be going into a very treacherous time politically. There's nothing wrong with the direction of travel. This, if, if we make it to the long run, it, it's a better world. Just like it took a little while to get steam to work for everybody and it took mm -hmm. a little while to, for, for services to work for everybody, this will eventually work out. The trouble is the speed of the transition. And in particular, it's the mismatch in the speed of job displacement and mm -hmm. job creation. Mm -hmm. You do the nice job exploring that in the book. I yeah. enjoyed that passage a great deal. Thank you. And, and there's actually some data. Or, uh, it's the only, only place where you mm -hmm. can actually see it happening. So the thing is that the job displacement is happening at the pace of digital technology, which is absolutely explosive. And the geniuses using this, their business model is to displace jobs. That's how they become a billionaire in the mm -hmm. next five years. Mm -hmm. If they can automate 10% of the nurse jobs, they'd be a billionaire. Now, they're not using this to create new jobs. But jobs, new jobs are being created, but it's at the pace of human ingenuity and entrepreneurship, mm -hmm. which, will, which will travel at its usual leisurely pace. So what I'm worried about is the job displacement will outstrip the job creation because one is driven by digital and one is driven by normal forces. Mm -hmm. And that's where the... So deep down, what should the government do about this? Plan A is like Denmark, and the government commits to helping people change. So this is a shock to the economy, and mm -hmm. the question socially is, who pays the adjustment costs? And in Denmark, they say, okay, hire, fire, whatever you want, go with the trends, but the government then stands by to help the workers do whatever is necessary to get a new job. Mm -hmm. If they have to move, they have to retrain, they have to invest in, in uh, say, new businesses or whatever. Mm -hmm. So people have the confidence that they will be okay. Therefore, they can accept this kind of change. And there's an underpinning of pensions and health care and child support and others that are part of the social fabric. Right. So there isn't quite so much at risk. Anxiety, exactly. Yeah, exactly. I, do, I think there's a nice analogy with the, the end of the uh, 19th century, where when people moved from the, from the countryside to the city, starvation and employment became linked. Hmm. So if you lost your job, very, very bad things could happen to you. And the hmm. same thing in, in Denmark, if you lose your job, nothing bad will happen to you, except maybe your, you may, your ego may be crushed sure, and you sure. lose some of your friend, your work buddies. But, you know, nowadays in America, if you lose your job, you may lose health care, you may lose, uh, mm -hmm. you know, your pension, you may lose, lot, you know, all the sort of underpinning things. You and may lose the ability to pay for your children to go to college, which puts them on a lower trajectory because of your misfortune. Yeah. Whether it originates in health or a sectoral disruption. I, exactly. I mean, so, it's, so this, that, that exposure is one of the things that actually drove the backlash, the fact that yes. people felt fragility and anger that, that, that things. So I, I think we are there. So the first though is the government, plan A is governments help people adjust and we let the speed of adjustment go. In general, it could be improvements as long as everybody gets reemployed. Plan B is what I call shelterism. And that is people in the world, the service sector and professional jobs, they say, well, I'm not anti-technology. I just need a little shelter from the storm. Mm -hmm. And uh, like Uber, Mm -hmm. So Uber was a digital technology that disrupted a service sector, taxis. And all over the world you saw different reactions. And in, in cities where the taxi drivers were relatively powerful politically, they used existing regulation to slow down the implementation. And there was still job displacement and there was still job creation, but they slowed down the whole yeah, pace the using regulation yeah, yeah. through shelterism. And I, I fully expect that as this progresses, the uh, wherever groups of people can join together and react to it. They'll use health, safety, environmental, and my guess is above all privacy regulations to prevent telemigration and to a certain extent automation. Mm -hmm. So that's, mm -hmm. that's plan B and I think that's going to happen anyway. You see it with Airbnb, uh, mm -hmm. Uber, uh, with uh, e-discovery, uh, self-drive trucks. They're using regulations to slow it all down. Mm -hmm. 
Now, that may not be enough because not, every, not everything is regulated, especially in the service sector. There's some like banking and medicine, which are very, very heavy regula regulated, but m tens of millions of service sector jobs are completely unregulated, no unionization, no control whatsoever, and those people won't be able to, at least in the time, next five years, to get the regulation to slow it down. Now, if that goes fast enough, and we don't actually know how fast it's going to go, in the book, I review the, the estimates. It can be a few million spread over 20 years, no problem. Hundreds of millions spread over five years, we're talking social revolution. Right. And especially since these white-collar people may join with the blue-collar worker we've talked about before who are angry, and if those two get together, we could see an explosion like the yellow vest, but way more general. Now, if that kind of social turmoil goes on, which is good for nobody, the government has to stand ready to just slow it down. And what I talk about at the very end of my book is that there is a kind of nuclear option on this. It's called employment protection legislation. So every advanced economy in the world has rules, including the United States, about firing people. So it's not costless to fire anybody anywhere in the rich countries. Mm -hmm. And all they would have to do is dial up those costs. Because the reason people are adopting automation and uh, foreign freelancers is to let people go. And if they can't let them go, or at least not as fast or as cheaply, they'll adopt it slower. So if it really becomes, you know, employment protection legislation has lots of unintended consequences. Mm -hmm. It's done horrible things in Southern Europe, for example. But I'm talking about if we're looking at 1920s, uh, hunger riots and hunger marches, stuff like that, who knows? Uh, it, 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 I don't know what the probability is, but I don't think we can say it's zero probability of that happening. I wouldn't say it's like 50%, but it is possible. And what I point out in my book is the governments have the tools to slow it down. So when you hear people writing about technology, many people say it's irresistible. We can't slow down Moore's Law. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't matter because it, what we're talking about is the employment impact of this. And governments can, across the economy, make it harder to fire people, therefore it will slow down the adoption. Right. These are so, human institutions. Human institutions. And bringing that humanity that you're calling forth into this realm of governance and perhaps, particularly in the United States, changing the ideology that you just have to be a rugged individual. Absolutely. And embedding you in a social context. I know Paul Collier has just <coughs> finished a book on the future of capitalism where he talks about reciprocal social obligations and he refers to Polyani's awareness of the mutuality in society, how it's dissipated and needs to be resurrected. Absolutely. In this uh, work, I, I hear all kinds of music. I started mm -hmm. with REM's The End of the World as We Know It. <laughs> okay. Oh, I Don't Feel Fine. <laughs> you had Shelter from the Storm. Right, right. And uh, what is it uh, that the talking heads always chant? The same as it never was. Same as it never was, <laughs> but, right. But right. uh, this is an outstanding exploration. Thank you. Both because of the historical lessons and how this time may be different, to quote Reinhardt Rogoff. Right. <laughs> but it's, it's, how would I say, this is a very formidable challenge to society that is upon us, and you've, which you might call, crystallized that vision. So my own uh, sense is that uh, because we made this video today, we can refute Gil Scott Heron, and this revolution is being televised. Televised. There we go. Thank, <laughs> Thank you, you very, very much. much. That's great.